Today on The Social Corner. I encourage people to work independently. Right. Because I don't think the mainstream has the moral courage or the cultural literacy to make programmes that we want to see. Colonial Christianity taught black people two things. Don't think about your faith. And mm. secondly, you can't change the world. And I argue that 400 years later, we're stuck. Social Corner with me, Dana Anderson and Pumzi. My guest today is an educator, author, and award-winning broadcaster. His teaching, literacy, and documentaries have shaped the discourse of social criticism and theology, and I am honoured to have him join me here today in the studio. Welcome to the show, Dr. Robert Beckford. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. We are coming out of somewhat of a tumultuous year, off the back of covid do you think we're actually coming out of it? or Well, hopefully, yeah. uh, but whether we are or not, what's clear is it's been a shambles in terms <laughs> of how this government has handled it. And I think what's going to be interesting going forward is to see what kind of inquiry we have and what the results are. Mm. And from the indicators so far, there's been a, a mishandling of the yeah. whole process. So that's one thing to look out for, I think. But like most people, I feel very saddened by the loss of life. I've lost people. Yeah who I've known. So it's been a tumultuous year on a personal level and for the whole nation. Because a lot of people have said it's given them time to reflect on life. Um, have you had any of those moments? Yes and no. Yes, in the sense that I think having time at home meant I could invest in my family, mm -hmm. my, my marriage and with my children and with my extended family as well. No, in the sense that when you give people who like to be busy more time, Tend to get more busy. So I think I probably overcommitted myself to a lot of projects that maybe in retrospect I shouldn't have committed myself to. So yes, some time for reflection, but um, also there's an opportunity to get a lot of things done. So I'm, I'm not, I don't feel bad about it, yeah. but um, a mixed bag, I would say. Mixed bag. So I want to start really at the beginning, because this show is all about looking at the social corner that change makers like yourself operate within and 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 I suppose dominate to some degree. And you're definitely somebody that I've been aware of for a long time. So it's really amazing to be sitting here with you today. But I say the first time you kind of came onto my radar, I was about in my early 20s, and I saw a documentary. I didn't know the name of it until the other day. Mm. It was called The Empire Pays Back. Mm. And I remember thinking to myself, gosh, this guy's bold. <laughs> you were really just saying what you thought and you were on the, I think it was on the BBC, was it on the BBC? It was on Channel 4. Channel 4, Channel 4. And I remember thinking, oh wow, I've not seen anyone bring these issues to light in the mainstream. And that's probably just because of where I was at that point. But it made me, it twigged something for me. Mm, mm. It started to, a, a train of thought uh, that would progress as I went on. And it just made me wonder about yourself. Where were you in life when you started to notice that your social consciousness was really being awakened? That's a really good question. And I, I'll try and answer it in a way that leads to that Channel 4 documentary. Yeah, sure. I'd say there are two things that really grounded me as a young black British person. Mm. My parents were people of faith, my mother in particular. But there's a contrast in my home. My mum was very spiritual, prayer and fasting, praying every night praying, especially on Saturday night when the football was on so we couldn't watch it, you know. So my mum was a person of prayer, you know, the old, old, old school prayer warrior in yeah. the church. My dad came to faith later on in life. And my dad was a Westmoreland man from the west in Jamaica. And the west of Jamaica was the most intense, enslaved part of the island. It's where the mm. bad people were, basically, mm. in terms of the toughest Jamaicans come out of the west, west allegedly. Because yeah. it was the most intensive um, uh, uh, slave plantations. So the people in Westmoreland are tough people. So my dad comes from Westmoreland. So consequently, I had at home this sense of a mother who prayed all the time, but then a father who was very strict, very strong, but always defending his children. Mm -hmm. And for me, the moment I became aware that my faith and my politics had to connect was when I was 11. I went to secondary school, and my woodwork teacher, who I'd never met before in the first class, made a racist remark. Because uh, I was trying to woodwork, you had to make this foolish lamp holder out of a piece of metal. You had to turn this metal. I said, what kind of foolishness is this? I was trying to work it out and I couldn't get the angles right. So I put my hand up and said, sir, 
I can't get this right. And he said, listen, if you don't get this right, and if you don't shut up, I'll put you on a banana boat back to Jamaica. Oh, I, was wow. like, I was like, my goodness, you know, I didn't know whether to smile or cry. I looked across the room, there's another black guy there. We look, we're giving that young black boy telepathy saying, what's going to go on? Is this the way this school is going to work? So I told my sister, who's a couple of years ahead of me, and she went home and said, you need to tell daddy. So I told my dad. My dad said, I've got to talk to him. Tell me when you have the next lesson. I've got to talk to him. And when my dad said that, it wasn't like verbal talk. It meant he was going to deal with the person. Mm. So my mum started to pray. She said, listen, I've got to pray for you because the school looked like it's going to be tough for you. And my dad said, I'm going to see the man. So true to his word, my dad came to school, knocked on the door. The next day I had the lesson. And the teacher went out. The teacher came back looking red and shocked. So I said to my dad, and Nina said, what did you say to him? My dad said, I picked him up like so. My dad was a builder. He's a Westmoreland man. And he said to him, put me upon that board. <laughs> put me upon that board. He literally picked yeah, him up. Yeah, that's right. And put him back down. You know, and the teacher went in, never had a problem with him after that. Mm. None of the kids, black kids in the school had a problem with him. Uh, and he never, never addressed us. So what I learned from that was that my mother was going to pray. That's the spirit of God. But mm. the spirit in action means you've got to do something. You've got to intervene in the world. Prayer isn't enough. Faith without works is enough. So that's how I came to a consciousness that faith, social justice, anti-racism were connected. It came out of that experience. Wow. I guess it was grounded theoretically and in terms of the world of ideas. When I was 14, I read the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I recommend five or six books that every young black boy reads. And one of them is the autobiography of Malcolm X because it deals with two things. The evolution of a critical mind, because Malcolm X was a great race critic. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? I mean, he did his PhD literally in prison, you know, read uh, copious amounts of literature and ideas. So Malcolm is a great race critic, but he com combines that critique of racism in America, in that tumultuous period of American history, with faith, Nation of Islam. And that provides you with this, a way in which you can link faith and justice together. Mm -hmm. So I recommend, so I read that at 14, and that got me really interested then in studying religion, but religion alongside politics. I ended up um, taking my A-levels in Britain, won a scholarship to go and study in New York, and that's where everything opened up. Wow. Because the Americans were just ahead of the game in terms of black theology, theology that is understood from a black perspective. So I engaged with that literature. And the African-American students were politically active. I ended up becoming the um, student senate president, president you know, so I was head of the students' union mm -hmm. uh, in my last year. So I got involved in student politics. So by the time I came back to Britain in 1980, yeah, I was a changed person. I came back an activist. So I want to get to that at some point. because we've, How mm. old were you at that point? Oh, when I came back, I was uh, 22. 22. Mm. So we've covered, I suppose, from the age of 11 to 22. Yeah. A lot mm. went on. Mm. But just rewinding us slightly, I just want to know a little bit more about your childhood. Because mm. you've talked about your mum and dad. Mm. Um, you had a sibling? Was oh, one? listen, I had a holy picnic in my family. You know what I mean? Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, big family. So, I mean, big family. I had um, both my parents had children before coming into um, the, their marriage, but there were five of us. I have five brothers and sisters. I have, I have uh, four sisters and me who are um, full family. But then I have um, three uh, uh, other siblings who are related to my mum and dad's previous relationship. So, technically, I have eight sisters and me. I'm the only boy. So I was, I was growing wow. up, I was raised in a house eventually when we all got together of um, me and all these black women. So um, it meant two things. One, my sisters made me do work, do housework. So to this day, I do all the housework. I love it because yeah. I said, you got to clean up the room. All right, then. You have to yeah. clean downstairs. You have to clean all right, then. So, so I'm, I'm, it really domesticated me as a man. Second thing, it made me love black women. Because I grew up with these really powerful dynamics. Listen, I'm, I'm the thickest one in my family. I mean, my sisters are just way ahead of me intellectually, much more articulate, and they'll all tell you they're more prettier than me. You know? so, <laughs> so basically, I was brought up with this house, in a household with these really powerful, dynamic, beautiful black women. And that's why I've always loved black women. I've always got respect for black women mm. and always attempted to do within my working life as much as possible for black women. Because I grew up with these these powerful black women. We had two things going on in our family. Cricket, because my dad was a mad cricket fan, and church. And mm. our lives revolved around that up until I was, uh, you know, 10 or 11. So my whole existence was built around uh, those realities. Cricket and mm. church. Mm. 
interesting because I, I read something about you where you said that you growing up you didn't really engage so much with the outside world mm. it was church and now you're saying cricket mm, mm. how did that affect you in shaping your I suppose your 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 thought processes and 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 do you think that was beneficial yeah yeah I think I think that's a really good question there are two things about that upbringing when I look back at it now it was fantastic because half of my dad's village in Westmoreland got transported to Northamptonshire Right. So we had all these uncles, real uncles, and then, you know, you have your um, uh, surrogate uncles and aunties, because, you know, back then everybody is, is your cousin? And then later on you realize, hey, yeah, my cousin, what are we calling him cousin for? He's, well, you know, well, because him come from the same district. <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 you know, so later on you realize these people really are, you are cousin him today. So um, it meant that we were really well protected on the one hand, and we lived in a extension of Westmoreland. So mm. I had these Jamaican men and families around me and they they taught me humor they also taught me an appreciation of the jamaican language which Mm. at the time i didn't know was so connected to african history african culture and that it was a repository of cultural ideas when I heard them speaking, um, I was just fascinated with them. We don't have what's going on? You know, I loved. I just loved to listen to them speak. Mm. And then, obviously, later on as an academic, I worked out how this language system worked, its African roots, how it was reconfigured within Jamaica, and why it's still it is a bona fide language, and why it's so important. Let me explain something to you about my my father, because I've got maximum respect for my father um, when I look back on how he protected us. There was a lot of racism. Forget about the racism in the so 1960s. Is, you're 1960s. Growing up in the 60s. Yeah, 1960s. Yeah, okay. yeah, I, was, I was born 1965. But I can remember 1970. Mm-hmm. At the front of my house, we had like a little porch. My dad made a weapon. My dad made this weapon at work. It was no gun. So it was no gun, man, you know. You know <laughs> God help us, you know. But he made this weapon, this stick. It was like his version of chucky sticks, you know, one stick with two, two uh, metal, two balls. Um, so it was something he made up. And he always had it by the door. It was only later on in life I said to him, why did you have that thing? He said, to protect the family. He said, sometimes there'd be skinheads or teddy boys come around the neighborhood um, cursing outside the house. He'd chase them with this thing. Your dad, your dad sounds like quite a bold person, mm. you know, especially at that time where um, racism, things were so heightened. Do you think that transferred into oh, completely. you? completely, because my dad was a union leader as well. Mm. He got involved in uh, trade unionism. He was a, a shop steward involved in strikes. I remember seeing my dad on television once. I said, what's your dad doing on television? And it's because he was calling out a strike in them days. They got out on strike for anything. It's too cold, them got out on strike. Too hot, them got out on strike. <laughs> the, 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 there's no water, they got out on strike. You know what I mean? So yeah. we used to see my dad on television. My goodness, what's daddy doing there? And I remember I, I have this vivid image of seeing him there. But I think his politics in the sense of his willingness to speak truth to power, mm. just say it as it is, confront oppression, trickle down in, in, in terms of shaping me and making me think I want to be like my dad in some respects. I want to be able to speak that, that freely. But what was more important was not what was said, but what my dad did. So mm-hmm. seeing my dad protect and defend me had a profound impact psychologically, making me think as a black person, this is what I have to do for my family. I have to do this for the community. Who else is going to, if nobody else is going to stand up, I'm going to stand up because I saw that image in my father. I was then able, you know, as a student, mm. to say, well, hold on, my father is doing this because he was, he was, he was influenced by Marcus Garvey. Mm. You know, my mother acted in the way that she was because my mother's grandmother was a Maroon. The Jamaican Maroons were the people who were never enslaved. Mm. They were people who fought a war against the British and won their freedom. So I look back, and now I would say, yeah, my, there's my dad's Garveyism, but there's also probably this Maroon spirit, this sense of independence and fighting for freedom and not being bound by anything going into your teenage years i'm just wondering at that point when you're in secondary school mm. college you know you, you before you got your scholarship were you starting to see the outside world mm. then like what mm. how were you starting to understand what was going on outside of that's that really, that bubble yeah it's a good question and i would say a crisis moment for me was between 14 and 16, because something happened to me at school which changed my, the whole course of my life. When I was 14, I signed for Wolverhampton Wanderers. 
Nothing ball. to play football. Yeah, it's all like, it's okay. only two ways out of the ghetto. When we were growing up, it was sports or entertainment, or if you had a real big brain. You mm. know, so my sisters were really brainy. So it was like, I'm going to they're going to study and go to university. And I remember my sister going, older sister going to university. And I thought, that's an option, you know, because she's having a good, good time, you know. So I always thought, that's an option. But I played football. And the school, it was days of you know, explicit racism. Mm -hmm. It would be, yeah, don't worry about going to English. Go and play, uh, practice your touch. Practice um, your left, left foot. So, so the school encouraged yeah, so that. So at times we'd miss classes and just go out and practice. That's people of my generation used to play sports. Teachers say, yeah, go and have a bit of practice. That's Mark Walters. Play for Villa. Then take them, skip classes and, and go and practice. Yeah. So we'd practice and practice. And at 14, Wolves scouted me and signed me as a schoolboy. So my ambition was to work hard for two years, develop my touch, develop all my skill set, and, and sign as an apprentice. I thought I had it made. However, my mum didn't think that was what God had called. My dad did, because my dad thought, yeah, man, I'll make some money. Mm -hmm. My dad would buy me the best football boots, you know, because he was thinking, yeah, you know, a couple of years' time, I'll get my money back. And I'd say, listen, <laughs> when, when you get your money, when you start making them big money, you must, you must um, want a house in Jamaica. And so I said, listen, my dad was dead keen. My mum said no. So my mum started fasting and praying. And she even got people in her church to fast and play, pray because she didn't believe that football was my calling. Your calling. And here's the interesting thing. I was in a math class, and we had a new math teacher come when I was 14 called Mr. Ralph. And the first lesson he had with me, he came in and he said, um, we're here to do math, blah, 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 blah. And um, he said, uh, uh, Robert, have you ever heard of Malcolm X? And I was thinking... Algebra. I said, I haven't done any algebra, sir. <laughs> I know Malcolm X. He was the one who gave me the autobiography of Malcolm X to read. Okay, so he, it's a white dude. Yeah. He was a member of the Revolutionary Communist Party. There was a group called that back in the day, you know. And um, he'd come to Coventry to build up the party. He's a white liberal, but obviously his politics extended into the classroom. So he, he got me interested in politics, reading, black literature, ideas. Now you could do this before the national curriculum. And over the course of two years, I got less interested in the sport and more interested in the world of ideas. So, okay, so academia really mm. was a, 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 a strong influence at that oh, yeah, stage. Yeah, that school teacher, it was just having that one significant teacher who exposed me to black history yeah. and black culture. He even one at one point said to me, there'll be plenty of black footballers, there will, there will never be enough black thinkers. He said that? Yeah, that's right, yeah. When he said that... Did, that, did you register? Did, he, did you understand what nonsense. he was saying? I thought it was talking nonsense because for me, sport was the way out. Yeah. But bit by bit, as I started reading the literature, engaging with the ideas, I realised that the life of the mind could be incredibly powerful and that academic ideas, intellectual thought was worth pursuing. At this point, because it sounds like this teacher, what was his name? Mr. Again? Ralph. Mr. Ralph was uh, a real turning point. Mm. But you've already talked about the contrast between what your dad wanted and mm. what your mum mm. wanted. So mm. your mum was saying, no, this isn't what I think. Mm. Do you, did, did you feel that there was a, was a, a faith element at that point oh, for yeah, you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For me, I mean, I was uh, uh, saved uh, at that point in time in terms of Christian language. And I believed in God. I believed that uh, Jesus yeah. had died for my redemption. Right. So I believed that. But now looking back on it, and I joke with my mum about it, I say, you prayed and God sent a Marxist. Mm. What does that say about how my life has turned out? Because my work has been about faith and politics. So I think that that moment was formative on a multitude of levels, making me realise that faith could connect to Malcolm X, could connect to civil rights, could connect to the anti-apartheid struggle, could connect to post-colonialism. All of those connections needed to be made as a Christian. That started at 14. And it moved me away from wanting to play football and into this, this other space. The irony is, you know, there were guys I used to train with now played for England, you know, had great careers. And I sometimes think, man, what would have happened if I hadn't listened to this teacher? You know, but I wouldn't have had it any other way mm. because this will take you back to the film. The film that we made in 2005, Empire Pays Back, I made that because... I'd push them consistently at Channel 4. The um, commissioner editor was Akil Ahmed at that time. I want to make a film about reparations. I want to make a film. And they were always saying, no, well, we're not sure, we're not sure. It conspired. Certain things happened that meant that they needed to be making a film that looked really black. Mm. So they said, do you want to make a film? I said, yeah, yeah. So we made that film. I had a great producer to work with. Now, that film 
so it's screened in Britain. It was screened in Jamaica. I don't know how Jamaicans got it because to this day I never got any <laughs> compensation or remuneration for that, you know. But anyway, they screened it in Jamaica. Um, uh, Irene Shepherd, the professor of history at the University of West Indies, said she watched it when they showed it in Jamaica. It had such a profound impact on her. She started talking to colleagues. They set up what became the Reparations Committee. The Reparations Committee in Jamaica has recently won compensation for the Caribbean. So Hillary Beckles, the University yeah. of, of um, Glasgow, that came through work that I did back in 2005, which helped inspire the Jamaicans. So for me, yeah. my ancestors, the mem honoring the memory of my ancestors by winning compensation and being part of that journey is more important than, than playing, than, than um, having, you know, play football. So for me, just that one thing would be sufficient. I really want to now get to that, that scholarship. Mm. So we've come out of your mm. teenage years and you've got, you said you got a scholarship to America. Mm. Was that the first time you travelled abroad? Yeah, because okay. my family were working class people. We couldn't afford foreign holidays. You know, the most we got was a, a, a trip every couple of days to Blackpool or some seaside <laughs> town. You know, it was, yeah. it was a hard times. We weren't an affluent family. So I was part of the Wesleyan Church. They had colleges in Canada and America. So I applied. I got accepted. I raised some of the money here. I got some of the schol uh, some of the fees were paid through scholarships. And so I, I went. I just literally got on the plane, got on the bus, and ended up at the college. I, I started out in Canada because okay. uh, they have a college in of a cheaper one. A college in Canada. I did um, uh, two years there. So yeah. the college I was at in Canada went to New York to play um, a soccer tournament amongst Christian colleges. And obviously, you know, I had my background in, you know, playing school, city, playing for uh, Wolves. So I just dazzled them, you know, just scored goals, blah, blah, blah. And so the college in New York, which hosted us, said, would you like to come here? And I said, yeah. And they said, we'll pay your fees and everything, blah, blah, blah. So I, they, they, they gave me a sports scholarship mm -hmm. to play, but it was a much better academic institution. So it was an academic institution, almost. Football and soccer, soccer wasn't the, didn't have a big sports program but they still like to do reasonably well. So that's how I ended up in New York. It was fantastic. So to be in your early 20s in New York, with everything that was happening in the 1980s was amazing in terms of hip-hop culture. Yes. Off. There was um, Jesse Jackson and the Civil Rights Movement push in Chicago. We're still going strong. Um, there was a real sense of um, interrogating ideas, which was really, really fantastic. My mentor was a former Vietnam vet, white sociologist who fought in Vietnam, was radically committed to a kind of leftist Christian tradition and inspired us all to think critically and out of the box. So a lot of the learning was not done through traditional means. It wasn't like saying, you know, I'm going to write an essay at the end of this. Some of the courses I took, you were graded on your capacity to ask good questions. Mm -hmm. Really, really progressive. Um, I met people who were of the faith traditions, other ethnicities. My roommate was a Jewish American, and we're still friends to this day. We're still Facebook friends. And uh, across the way from me was a, a, a European American guy who was really into making things. His first um, project made him a multimillionaire. So it's only happened in America. Everybody made millions except me, my dormitory. You know, there's a guy above me who had a travel agency, started on campus, developed into a business. Um, so it was it was fantastic place to be as a young person in the 1980s mm. with everything that was happening. Reagan, you know, um, was doing his thing. Um, so it shaped me in two ways. One, it made me more cosmopolitan, willing to engage with difference people coming from all different parts of the world. And secondly, American theology is much more hands-on. Mm. So it's not just about rational ideas and concepts and abstract ideas, it's much more about what do you do with them? How do you turn this idea of God being the God of justice into engaging with incarcerated men? Mm. So one of my courses was a criminology taught course that was team taught in prison. So we went up to Attica and, and had a class with men that had 20, 30 years to spare who had taken all these degrees in criminology. It was a fantastic experience. Mm. It was a really progressive institution. So it shaped me in that way, in terms of making me see theology as being about action, not just talk, but action. Speaking of action, you're talking about the 1980s, mm. you talked a bit about the explosion of hip hop. And I, I just want to um, talk a bit more about that, because I know that 
your ideologies and ideas have framed your work within music. Mm, mm. Did that that experience out there seeing how because hip hop hip hop was quite political, mm, wasn't mm, it, when yeah. it started? Mm. Did that experience out there help? Um, serve some of the work that you've done to date, such around yeah. the, the Jamaican Bible remix sure. and things like sure. that? Yes, a good question. I think that what studying in North America did was teach me what we call interdisciplinarity, right. the ability to connect different dis disciplines. Because in the American educational system, higher education, you do, if you've taken a liberal arts degree, you do two years of everything. Mm. So I was doing maths courses at university. I hated math. You know, um, history, politics. So, so you took a bit of everything, and then your second two years, you specialise. Mm. So it makes you, as an undergraduate, just see connections all the time. Mm. And that kind of thinking meant that when I came back to England and engaged in postgraduate study, went back to Birmingham, lived in Handsworth for a while, it, and when I was doing my PhD, it just meant I was always looking for connections. Mm. So consequently, when I was in church on Sunday and listening to the songs, I'd be thinking about the theological content of the songs. I'd be thinking, oh, hold on a minute. How come we're in the ghetto here in Handsworth and we're singing songs about lilies and valleys? <laughs> that doesn't make no sense to me. I can understand this value in terms of transcendence. Why aren't we singing about what's happening up the road? Yeah. Why are we singing about the concrete? The kids can't get jobs. What went, what was, so it just made me make those connections. The album that came out of that experience much later, 2017, in a way is related to the interdisciplinarity in North America raising critical questions in the 1990s, living in Handsworth and going to a Pentecostal church and wanting to see black churches sing songs about what people faced in their real day-to-day -day lives and not just songs that were imported from America or from white British people who didn't understand their experience, sing about our experience. Because the Rastas were, you know, hip hop culture did that, why can't the church do that? So that, those ideas eventually filtered into what became the Jamaican Bible remix. So because we're on it, uh, mm. you know, I haven't finished with this American mm. experience, mm. but because mm. we're on it, I do remember when the Jamaican Bible came out mm. and there was it was quite controversial mm. Um, mm. from my standing because a lot of people were like, this is blasphemy. Like some people were like, what are we mm. doing? Mm. Pat was not a language. Mm. And at the time, I don't think I thought much about it. Mm. But I was thinking about it recently. I was thinking, well, you transfer the, translate the Bible into... Uh, you know, Japanese, Mandarin, whatever. What's the difference? And I think it was this thing around Patwa, mm. whether it was a language mm. or, you know, a dialect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You were obviously quite involved mm. in that mm. whole happening. Mm. Mm. What was your thinking? What, what were your thoughts at the time as to why you were contributing to the project? Right, yes, good question. Um, firstly, for me, Jamaican is a language. If you look at how the linguist will show you how language functions, it functions as a language. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, Jamaican Patwa is the Jamaican language, although, and I would consider Jamaicans like my father bilingual, because mm -hmm. they can speak English and then they'll go into Jamaican. So I acknowledge that. And that's an important point to make for us, for the Jamaican diaspora, for two reasons. Number one, because that language is always demeaned. It's seen as the language of the poor, the working class, the ignorant. You know, and so consequently, translating the Bible into that language is legitimating the language of the poor. So that was really, it was really important. Second thing why it's important is because in our British educational experience, my Asian friends were considered to have two languages. They speak uh, Punjabi or Urdu and English. And therefore, when they struggled in school, they got help as speakers of English of a second, second language. When black British people of my age struggled with English, they said, well, it's because they speak that pidgin English, that's, that Creole, which is no good, and, and it wasn't treated as a language. Mm. So we didn't get the same kind of help. We're actually seen as educationally subnormal. For me, it's important because of where it stands politically within our educational history. So with my children, I'll tell them, I mean, they mock it because they think it's funny. They'll say, hey, daddy, you know, my son and my daughter, <laughs> you know, I, I get that. I don't have a problem with it. But what I do is I, sell them, I, I, I tell them it's a legitimate language. And here's the thing. Our ancestors left us a memory of their experience in the language. Mm. So in the book, for example, well, in the previous book, which was about film, I talk about the word nyam, you know, mm. and how nyam has no root in African language or even the Caribbean. It's a made-up word by enslaved people. Why? They wanted us to know what, it, what, it, what was it like to be enslaved. You were nyam out. And when you nyam out something, you completely devalue.
devour it. Mm. That's what slavery meant. You, you, you became a mindless body. Wow. And in Haiti, they have a way of remembering that. But being a mindless body, they call it being a zombie. Mm. So there's a, 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 an anthropologist called Mimi Scheller who does work on Haiti, because there's no such thing as a zombie. Zombie, as a, as a kind of spiritual entity, a zombie is how Haitians remembered slavery. What did it mean to be a, a, an enslaved person? Like a mindless drone working in the fields. Wow. That's what a zombie is. Zombie mythology takes shape when the Americans get to Haiti in the 1920s. They invade the place and they misinterpret zombies and, and develop these Hollywood films, you know, zombie, white zombie, zombie death and all that. And people miss out on the fact yeah. that it's actually about what it what? means to experience racial capitalism. What was slavery like? It was like being a zombie. The Jamaicans remember the zombie experience, but they talk about it in terms of language, Niam, Niam mm. Asal. Mm. There are these examples in court cases in Jamaica where the enslaved people are using this language of devouring, of being devoured, of being picked up, of being drained. Right. So it's there within the language. So I say to my children, you need to understand the language to understand the history. Mm. Do you think that's getting lost? Oh, yeah, definitely, because the... Jamaican diaspora is, is increasingly becoming quite small mm. within Britain for a variety of reasons, you know, in terms of less migration. Um, I think the next census will show that there are um, more people of mixed heritage mm -hmm. than people who are African Caribbean. Uh, more, you know, if you're looking at, um, you know, the percentage of black men marrying out of um, the community, the imaginary community and black women, we've, we've reached the end of black Britain. We're now into a phase of beige Britain in reality. So wow. I think that experience of the Jamaican diaspora, post-war experience is finished, you know, unless there's mass migration due to Brexit and then needing the Holy Yardis to come and do work for them. It ain't going to happen. So I think it, there's, it's incumbent then upon us who have lived that experience, seen our parents come in the 1950s, have children and some even have grandchildren who are now British citizens to tell that history. So that's what I've attempted to do, you know, with my work. With your work. Mm. And, I, and I think it's it's, it's phenomenal work, um, but, but I, I, I have a concern about the interest. Mm. And what I mean by that is that this generation, mm. what are they, Generation Z? Mm. Gener mm. Uh, um, their interest in wanting to understand the language, in wanting to understand mm. the history behind it, as you've mm. just so articulated yeah. to me. Yeah. How do we link in the past with modern society? Because currently, yeah. that's not... The focus. Yeah, so that's a really good question. And I'll give you an example from three contexts that I've worked in. Yeah. When I teach in prison, it's not a problem mm. because I teach the men how they've come to be in this predicament because they don't know their history. Right. If you know the history of, um, you know, of um, uh, criminalizing black bodies from 1493 through to, through to the present, it makes you understand how you end up in criminal activity. You know, you make moral choices, but things are structured to work against you as a black young person. So the history works when I've talked, when I've done prison education. I worked as a postgraduate researcher for two years in Birmingham prison, working with incarcerated men. Every now and then I go back and run prison courses. I've got one planned um, even in Winchester, but that's connected to the green economy. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it works in that context. I've also worked then with university students. They want to learn. They're there to learn. And... Therefore, you tell them what you know, you have them explore the material, and then it's up to them what they do with it. Mm. So some of my students are now teaching. So Dulcie McKenzie, who teaches at Queen's, one of my PhD students, they're just hiring another person, one of my PhD students. We go to Birmingham City University, where they set up the Black Studies course. It was originally set up by Lisa Palmer and Kahindi Andes. Lisa Palmer was one of my PhD students. Yeah. It's now, there's Dion, um, I can't remember her surname, who's that? Dion was one of my PhD students. Kehinde Andrews, I mentored for a while. Kehinde Andrews' wife did a year with me. She's, a, she's lecturing at... Um, I actually uh, know uh, that, her. Exactly. Yeah. So, so for me, it's what yeah. you pass on. I've invested in black people with the history for them to go and do, to them to to go do, and do something wise. with it. And the third context is at Queen's at the moment, where we have plenty of young people on the undergraduate, postgraduate courses, with 60 black people there. So we've moved into generation next generation. We're, we're doing that work, you know. So for me, you can only you can only influence people in your your sphere. You know, you can use the media, you can do other things. But I would say that there is an interest. The problem is that 
you don't necessarily have the platform for getting it out there. Mm. You know, so for example, you look, if I go to Channel 4 and I want to make a program on, you know, the history of the criminalization of the black body, I'm not going to make that. They wouldn't mm. even understand it. They'd be threatened by it. My goodness, mm. it's gonna, what's it going to turn up? It's going to show that. You know, so they do not have the cultural literacy or the moral courage to make programs that explain our past. Or what they'll do is they will allow only certain types of people to make it. You know, it, and, and that's always been the case. TV is not democratic. It's about patronage. Yeah. You know, so my entry into that world was because I had a patron, a commission editor, who was willing to entertain the ideas that I wanted to develop. So that's the problem. The, the issue is always how we get it out there. And hence my interest in using music, church music that way. The Jamaican album was all about that, using mm -hmm. the media then to extend and engage these ideas. You see, so, so you can reach the people. Look, there was a youth who contacted me a few years ago and said, I'm, I'm a rapper, um, I want to meet with you because I want to find out how to develop program ideas. I said, yeah, I said, I said oh, all right. He says, I'll buy you dinner. I thought, you know, you know, that's the best way. To, I said, yeah, man. Give me some so anyway, food, I took yeah. to some Jamie Oliver um, <laughs> vegetarian, something like that. You know, I was looking for some meat. So I went, wait, wait, there's steak there. <laughs> anyway, so, so I, I schooled him. I said, this is what you do, blah, 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 blah. He had some funny name. You know, but I took, I've always taken the time. Funny name. It's a Carla. Oh, right, wow. so, so, right, so for me, that's been my, listen, when I started working in TV, I made a film with Trevor Phillips in 1998. That was the breakthrough film. BBC Four said, would you like to make films? I met this young um, producer. He said, would you make films with me? I said, I got two ideas. Write them down. We pitched them. We made them. We won two awards. It was David Olashoga. Oh. That's it. So for me, it's about what how, it's Harriet Tubman in the media. How many people can you take with you? Listen, mm. I used to have a radio show on BBC WM where any black student in media who said to me, I need some work. I said, come. I said, mm -hmm. calm down, but there'd, there'd be 20 other people there. But I said, listen, just write it down on your CV. A youth that used to sell me shirts said to me, I want to do TV. And I said, this is how you do it, blah, 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 blah. And he said, I need some work experience. I said, come on. I said, what are you into? He said, I'm into African music. I thought, I thought, I ain't really into that. But listen, I'll give you a slot on the show. So 10 minutes on the show, come and do Afrobeat. You know, you know, his West African dude. Come do it. He did it for six months and he said to me, I can't come back. I said, what's the problem? He said, I've got a job working for the BBC. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm presenting BB Blue Peter. That's Andrew Akinwaleri. Andrew Akinwaleri got his break. And to this day, I never got a discount on the shirt. <laughs> but every time I see him, I say, hey, Bredrin, <laughs> you, you made it large. What, what about that shirt? I never even got, a, not even a 10% off the shirt. So for me, in terms of the next generation, you invest yeah. by pouring yourself into other people. It's, that's amazing. It really is because I, I, it's, it's, I don't see it as a common attitude. Mm, some, mm, you know, mm. some people, and that's fine, but it's really that idea of reaching back mm. to um, bring someone forward. Mm, mm. But I imagine you've only got two hands. There's only so mm, much yeah, of that you yeah. can do. What do you think about the emergence of these new technologies and platforms like Instagram, YouTube, because when you started, it was, as you said, four, mm. four stations. Mm. And now we have a whole mm. internet to, mm. you know, converse with. Mm. Um, going back to what you said was the problem, which was getting it out there. Mm. How do you take that influencing and shaping of this next generation mm. And, and encouraging them to use these platforms yeah. to spread their yeah. message? That's a, good, that's a really good question. I encourage people to work independently. Right. Because I don't think the mainstream has the moral courage mm. or the cultural literacy to make programs that we want to see or programs that are written with our experience in mind. And I'll be quite specific. What's happened, radical feminist, bell hooks, African-American feminist, talks about living in white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. And what she means by that is when you live in a society that's dominated by whiteness, maleness, and um, uh, you know, you mean, it means that some groups are going to get more advantages than others. And that works in the media all the time. Mm -hmm. And we're now in a predicament where if you want to talk about blackness, um, and don't have a problem with this, but I'm saying this is how it's shaped by the context, it tends to be people of mixed heritage mm. who are talking about black experience, mm -hmm. you know, which is fine. Um, uh, um, but it's just recognizing that that's become the understanding of blackness. Yeah. Problem though with it though is it has an impact in terms of gender because it means also that the 
people who then talk about black women's experience tend to be people of mixed heritage. So it means that if you're a dark-skinned black woman, there's very little space for you in terms of mainstream television, in terms of articulating ideas. And we saw that played out with that recent documentary on yeah. black women and, and birth. You know, and the yeah. problem of... of, of um, uh, Candice uh, Braithwaite. Exactly. Yeah. All of that. So, so for me, the mainstream is always going to reflect the interests of the power, you know, white male power within Britain. You know, so, yeah. so what I say to people now is, look, understand that only the mainstream can only tell certain stories in a particular way. If you want to tell our stories, be bold, be creative, and use the other platforms that there are. Is there a requirement then or a necessity for people of colour to be operating in both spheres? So somebody like yourself, you can only make a certain type of programme, mm. but it's a traffic light to you, isn't it? Mm. It's, it's somebody like me saying, I want to know more about him, mm. and then going and watching you yeah. speak, going and watching your own independent mm. films. Do you think that we should avoid that? Then? Oh, no, or, no. Or, or no should I think we... you can work it. I think if yeah. you can work it, and make it work for you, that's great. But recognize the limitations. Mm. I was only given that space because I had a commissioned editor, who was a working class Pakistani from Bolton, who understood black working class culture, mm. and therefore was willing to give me an opportunity to make a number of films. He, once he left the Channel 4, I knew my time was finished. So I moved with him to the BBC and made some films, films with him. You only have a certain shelf life. I now do radio because, and BBC Radio World Service, because again, I have a person there who likes the ideas that I bring to him and is willing to make them. So, so there's only a certain amount of black programming that's going to get there. If you want to get your ideas out, you have to find, find other outlets. So that's the only reason I had that, 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 that support from those people. Without that support, it would be very, very difficult. So I try and operate in both spaces. Yeah. If you can do it, do it. If you can't, find a way to get your ideas out. Because the demand is there. Oh, yeah. Where yeah. It, whether, regardless of whether or mm. not they want to make it, there is demand. Yeah. People want to hear. There is demand, but black viewers have gone onto social media, gone onto Netflix, gone onto other platforms where there are those programs. You know, so in a way, you know, we don't need um, the BBC. What we do need is to develop our own infrastructure, our own networks, engagement with the Caribbean, North America, and establish our own thing. And that, that's what I'm much more interested in, is that, that infrastructure. And I think you're absolutely right. I, I personally don't feel that's going to happen until we become proud mm, of, mm, those, mm. Of, the, of the elements that make up those mm, infrastructures. Mm, mm. Um, which brings me to... I, th I, think, I think it is partly that, yeah. but let me say, it is happening. You know, there are West you African think? communities who are doing this kind of thing. Good. We've got yeah. platforms where they're connecting with the people back home, and some of the churches are doing it because they're, they're media, uh, they're global media entity. So it does happen. It, um, the COVID lockdown has been good for that because the amount, I mean, literally every day there's a seminar or a lecture or something happening somewhere in the Black Atlantic that I've been able to tune into. If I wasn't here today, there was, some, there was a green black green uh, conference taking place today online. I was listening to one yesterday, something in Nigeria. So there's a lot happening in terms of the knowledge. You know, there is a communication network. It's just that to get the resources to make films and movies can be a bit more tricky. Now, that kind of confidence comes from saying there's no other way. It is get rich or die trying. That kind of mentality it's saying, I'm going to do this even if it, not even if it kills me, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get this out there. And I think it's that kind of commitment, what you've termed as, you know, being proud. It's, I'd say it's a kind of commitment to getting the job done. And that's what's required. Going back to you as 22-year-old mm. you in mm. America, mm. I imagine because of what we see of America, that you saw that, you saw the spike oh, leaves, yeah. you saw oh, yeah. even just in the, the general community. Those Every black student I knocked head with had a side hustle. But you know? here, so, and, and, when and, you came back, yeah, yeah, what was the contrast? Oh, the con oh, that's a good question. Three things I would say for, for sure. One is when I came back, it was the late 1980s, in terms of church life, I felt like an alien. Because right. I've gone to America, I engaged in radical theological ideas, came back to a very conservative church, 
I had no future there. So that was the first thing. In terms of the society, because America doesn't have a strong welfare network, people have to hustle to make it. Mm. So it made me aware that it can be quite easy here to coast because you always know that there's a safety net. When there's no safety net, people are literally keeping busy, are hustling, are keep, you know, are finding ways and means to get out of poverty, legally or, or illegally. So that was, a, that was a bit of a shock. I think the third thing was the shock of then working out what to do next. Mm. You know, what do I do next? I've got this uh, degree in religion and sociology, and I decided to go and study um, in London to complete a master's degree. And I came back to Birmingham, took a year off, and then started the PhD. So the, the sense of church not being a place where I was going to fulfill my destiny, because I wanted to be involved in church life as a preacher, but there was very, a real hostility towards me as a young academic or young uh, member of the church with a degree in theology. I didn't get that kind of love or support or platform from the church to do other things. So I left that, that denomination, went to another denomination and decided to pursue an academic career. So it's kind of ironic, you know, back in the day, my mum didn't want me to do football because she felt there was something else. And then when I came back, that door that I thought I was meant to be going through in terms of church life got closed. So I ended up pursuing an, ac an academic career. Does that link back to what you said earlier about um, the British church uh, and, and I suppose the, mm. the Caribbean church being taught not to think, just being taught to praise? Yeah. So you came back as a thinker. Mm. And I can almost imagine it would have been, well, we never sent you off to do mm. this. Mm. Mm. You know, it, it, it's that shock, actually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Of, oh yeah. something's changed, but we wasn't expecting it to be this. You're completely right. Look, in my, my last book, it's called Documentaries Exorcism, which is half about documentary theory, half about colonialism. I argue that colonial Christianity taught black people two things. Don't think about your faith. Mm -hmm. And secondly, you can't change the world. Mm -hmm. And I argue that 400 years later, we're stuck with the coloniality, the continued influence of these colonial ideas. So we don't do critical intellectual thought around theology. A variety of reasons for that, not just the colonial influence. We've always been estranged from academic institutions. Very few theology departments reach out to the black church. Today, out of maybe 2,000 theologians in Britain, teaching at British universities, only about three. You know, so theology is the last bastion of white supremacy in Britain in terms of the British Academy. Only yeah. just started to think about decolonizing. Only just started to think about whiteness. Mm. But the second thing is we were not taught to change the world. Faith wasn't seen as revolutionary. And part of the reason for that was because if you tell enslaved people that knowing Jesus means that you can be free from sin and free from any form of bondage, they're going to say, well, why you got me in these manacles? Mm. So if you instead say to them, you can be free inside spiritually and you don't have to worry about this world, just worry about the world to come, you can oppress them. Mm. You see? Now, not all enslaved Africans believe that. Jamaica in particular, the first Africans who heard that run off into the hills. This is foolishness. <laughs> this is what we learned in Africa. This is work with our African cosmology, where everything is holistic. There's no division. You know, African cosmology does, uh, refuses the separation of the spirit and the material. Everything is mixed up together. You know? So they refuse that. That's where you get the tradition of, of, of Marunic in the Caribbean, in Jamaica in particular. So my theological ideas come from that enslaved tradition, the resistance tradition. So we were taught that, don't think about it, not all of us believed in it, and that's the tradition I tried to excavate. The history of black Christians in the Caribbean and Britain who refused to separate the spiritual and political, who wanted to bring them together. I want to talk a little bit about, about mm. the political mm. and race mm. now, um, and thinking about this idea of social change mm. and where we were then. Mm. Um, as a society, and as opposed to now with movements like Black Lives Matter. Mm. Um, do you see progress? Yeah, of course there's progress, um, because my kids don't run home from school wondering a, a, about um, racist gangs going to beat them up, which is what we had to do. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my, I joke with my children and say, listen, when the school bell used to go, I used to go, I'm gone. <laughs> why, why'd you run so fast? That? Because there were, that there were kids from the other school who'd be out there ready to kick our heads in. So there is progress. There is progress in terms of education. You can see that the, the curriculum has moved slightly to become more inclusive. You can see it in terms of the workplace. People have become more conscious. Death of George Floyd has meant that people have had to re-educate themselves, have had to ask critical questions. 
while I recognize there is progress, you also have to be, you, you also have to temper your hope with the realism that change takes place very slowly and change in relation to the liberation of black people will always be slow if you're waiting on the system to move. Conversely, if you're waiting on ourselves to liberate ourselves, that's going straight away mm -hmm. because the liberation comes from reading, knowledge, knowledge of self, love of yourself, love of your people, resisting any form of oppression, whether that's race, class, gender, um, a homophobic homophobia that attempts to brutalize people just because of the way that in which they are. So for me, um, yeah, I see some progress, but the struggle continues because of the insidious, demonic nature of racism in British society. And we've got a long way to go mm -hmm. because the resistance now comes from the top. Prime Minister who got into office despite racist comments about black and brown people, racist comments, sexist comments about Muslim uh, women. Uh, we have a regime in power that refuses to recognize the working of structural evil, refuses to understand the way in which privilege and power work to maintain the status quo in Britain, even write reports to legitimate that, that contradict previous reports. So, so yes, there's progress, but we'd be crazy uh, to think that, the, that the, we've won the battle. So there's still work to oh, do. Oh, yeah, completely. Just a quick answer, though. Do you feel liberated? I've, I felt liberated the day I met Jesus. Okay. So, for, so you know, as a, as a Christian person, for me, that's, that's, that's the start of it because then I found, I found purpose, I found focus, and as a black Christian, I found a way of interpreting the history and making sense of it and working for redemption. Mm. So for me, I would never just call myself a Christian. I'm a, my, my faith is contextual. I am part of the African Caribbean diaspora in Britain. Go back five, seven generations in my family, you get people who are coming from West Africa, mm. you get people who are coming from Europe. You know? So I recognize that complex history and that informs my identity, including my Christian identity. I don't think becoming a Christian means I become colorblind. I think it's the opposite. I think for me, coming to faith means that I see the creativity and difference that there is in the whole world. I accept it, I see it as equal, and I celebrate it. Yeah. Mm. I want to talk a little bit about you in this time, because mm, mm. as I said at the beginning, mm. your accolades are mm, endless. Mm. I don't have a, a paper long mm, enough. Mm. What was happening to you as a person whilst this was whilst you're doing all of this, like, what was the inner growth, the journey? Where was your life at at that point? That's, that's a really good question. I, I would say um, I'm restless mm. and I've always had a restless spirit and always felt there's something more to be done and to be developed. Now, I just so, want to ask you, mm, restless, mm, when you, are you talking about discontentment or are you just saying um, you just like to be busy? No, 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 I would say it's, feeling that there's purpose to your life right. and that you only get one shot. Mm. There's, this is not a rehearsal for something else. This is it. So what I've always wanted to do is maximise every opportunity, every door that opens and do the most that I can. So even at 55, I'm planning for the next 10 years. I'm thinking, right, what do I want to accomplish over this next 10-year period? What else can I do? Because there are still these gaps, you know? So in terms of what I would say I've learned and the way in which the growth of me has come more through family. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of learning patience, you learn patience with, with kids. You know what I mean? You know, you sit down and you see kids that, my goodness, boy, I can't say nothing. I can't say nothing. Just help me, Jesus. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get angry. I'm not gonna... So in terms of learning patience, that's come through through kids. In terms of learning to become more compassionate and loving, that's come through being married. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just come through engaging with the, the world outside. That's come through have, you know, my wife is um from Jamaica. Wife is from Port Moore. You know they're tough people. So you have to learn compassion, and you have you know you have to learn um, to to do your bit. You know, so it's come through those kind of relationships. I think, in terms of forgiveness, I've learned that through extended family. Because when you have beefs with beef with your family, you have to decide whether or not you're going to be the person who makes peace or the person who maintains the grudges. I've always been the peacemaker, so that's been a, a process of growth for me. I think. Why I would say, um, uh, one thing I would say, which is, which, is, which is significant, is that people think as you get older, you're meant to get more mellower. 
I've decided, I've really worked hard at not trying to do that. I've tried to maintain the radicalism, maintain the commitment, maintain the willingness to speak out, because if you don't do it, it doesn't then mobilize other people and help people around you feel they can have the courage to do it. If there was a life lesson, mm. if you could teach one last class mm. and only one lesson mm. to everybody in that class. Oh, easy, easy, and it would be loving blackness. So for, for, for black people to love blackness. You're currently um, doing a research project exploring the theology and ecolo ecology of yeah. the transatlantic yeah. slave trade. Um, so this is a multi-platform project. Mm, mm, mm. And there's a book, yeah, a yeah, film, yeah. and a documentary. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. is this all independent or is this... Um... Yeah, some of it, there's, there's a couple of projects that I'm working on. I'm, 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 in terms of jobs, I work three jobs. I'm Jamaican, you know, so I have to have treat my dose. I have to have one job in England, you know. So my main job is working at the University of Winchester, where I'm the professor of climate and social justice. So basically... My work looks at the intersection between climate change mm -hmm. and how it affects our minority communities. Because whether you're in South London or South Sudan, the people who are being most impacted by climate change are black and brown people. Mm -hmm. But we have been neglected and haven't had a seat at the table in terms of talking about, reflecting on climate change, working politically to resist, to, to, to um, create a better environment. So that's my work at the moment. So I run the Winchester Institute for Climate and social justice. That's my, that's my main job. Okay. Um, but I also do some work on the side, still in theological education with the Queen's Ecumenical Foundation, where I help supervise PhD students who are working in, in theology. And I also um, have some work with Vu University in Amsterdam, which is the Dutch university, again, related to my work in, in theology. But so two projects. One project I'm just finishing off is called the Jamaican Bible Remix, which is a, a, an album which has a book attached to it, and that's about decolonizing gospel music. So that's, that's, I'm finishing that off. That'll be published by Bloomsbury at the end of the year. But I'm working all alongside that on another project, which is about slavery and Christianity. And it comprises of an independent film. I'm making that with the Movement for Justice and Reconciliation this summer, and that's going to be about reconciliation. How do we deal with the fact that the church was complicit with genocide? Mm. That's one thing. Then secondly, covered it up. That's amazing. That's amazing. So the work continues. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can't stop. You can't, you can't stop. stop. You have to keep going. You have to, keep, I mean, you have to leave a legacy. Yes. You know, um, and I think the key thing is this, you know, and I say this constantly to my children, that I'm average. The only thing that distinguishes me from the people I went to school with, I was willing to try. You know, with television, oh, oh, it's so hard to break. I'm going to try. You know, oh, writing a book is really, I'm going to try. Oh, this is what, I'm going to give it a go. So I say to my children all the time, if you are willing, you know, move in faith. Take that leap of faith. Take that risk. Even if it doesn't work out, you know, it, it will fall into place. You are, um, this so show, obviously, it's called The Social Corner, mm. as you know, and it's all about um, identifying that, that space, the social mm, corner mm, that you mm, operate mm, in. Mm, mm, mm. How would you like to see your social corner um, evolve in the future? Wow, wow, it's a good question. I think it is fundamentally moving, linking the church, the university, the community here with the global community around issues of climate change. That's what I'm really, really interested in because if we don't get that right, we're all finished. You know, and tragically, the people who produce less CO2, people in the Southern Hemisphere, black and brown people, are the most likely to, are being at this point in time, brutalized by climate change. So the cutting edge of issues around race, racial justice for me, collide with issues around climate change. So my social corner has got to be a greener one, and one that is, is, is much more committed to environmental um, protection and resisting climate change. Dr. Robert Beckford, it's been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you, Thank so you for much. having me. Thank you. Thank you. Cut.